My name is Shawnee Anson, and I'm the Program Manager for Global Health Security and Pandemic Preparedness at the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, thank you so much for being here today and for joining us at our very last seventh event of Outbreak Week. Um, before we close, we have one more speaker this afternoon. And as Ashish mentioned this morning, uh, there's a very unique feature of Outbreak Week where we've been working with the Smithsonian Institute for the last year to figure out how we could bring uh, a mobile version of the exhibit that they've been creating for the past three years to Harvard and also to 20 countries around the world. So we're excited to have that here today. Um, and as many of you have probably already seen, we have a bunch of panels in the back of the room. Uh, we also have several in the hallways um, leading up to this room and 10 panels downstairs. Uh, in the lobby in the hallway that goes there. So um, we'd like to invite you uh, after the meeting ends at four to check this vid uh, exhibit out. Um, we're gonna hear a little bit more about it in a moment from Dr. Sabrina Schultz, who's the curator of this exhibit. Um, but I'd also like to just uh, share a little bit about the Harvard version of this exhibit, which is a customized version. And we are very grateful to have received the support from eight different departments and institutions across the university that were eager to develop panels um, for this exhibit on their research. And I see one gentleman just walked in the room, Dr. Michael McCormick of the history department. And he generously um, contributed two panels to this exhibit absolutely fascinating work uh, that he's working on so i encourage you to go talk to him at the end of this uh, event and also check out his panels um, i also would like to thank uh, simpris technologies our technology partner on this exhibit who has generously donated um, these panels that you see here today as well as a corporate comp contribution for us to bring this exhibit to 20 countries around the world uh, we're thrilled for their support and uh, the ability to use their mass customization platform that has offices all over the world and they also own Vistaprint, for those of you that have been on the Vistaprint website, um, to use their platform to ship this all over the world. So thank you to Simpress. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sabrina Schultz, uh, who a couple of us met about a year and a half ago at her office in DC. Um, and I will say she has probably the coolest office that I have ever seen with bones scattered everywhere. Um, she is a research anthropologist and curator in the Department of Anthropology. Um, so her primary job is research, but for the last three years she's been curating this amazing exhibit in DC, which I was told was not even her real job. Um, so if you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend it. Uh, she's also the director of the Smithsonian Institution Bioimaging Research Center, um, which she will share a little bit more with you today. So thank you so much for coming, Sabrina, and we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, thanks uh, so much uh, for all of you um, being here. Uh, today and also for Harvard, Harvard um, Global Health Institute for leading this effort, um, all the amazing um, work that's been on display and all the amazing events throughout the week. Uh, I don't know how many people saw Contagion on Wednesday night. That's when I arrived. That's the first one that I caught. I love that film. And if you haven't seen it, cover your ears because I'm just going to say that my favorite part of that movie is the end, right, where we find out where the virus came from. And right now, I kind of feel like I am the end of Contagion uh, because I'm going to tell you where this show, where this exhibit came from um, and how it actually came to spread around the world. So the outbreak exhibit um, is on display right now at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. It's been open for about four months, which makes it um, our newest show in that building. Um, but Outbreak is actually new for a number of reasons. Uh, it is new in that it is exploring the uh, origins um, in the natural world of infectious diseases, that it is um, you know, showing uh, human health in an ecological context, and that it's highlighting human activities um, as drivers um, of disease emergence 
and uh, as increasing our pandemic risks. And so, you know, for our museum, um, in a way, we took a risk, right? Because we are presenting science and subject matter that is not historically, not even currently, entirely within the realm of our expertise. Um, certainly, outbreak does make a lot of sense um, to be in our museum. I mean, it aligns really well with our mission to understand the natural world and the place of humans within it. However, um, certainly that, that mission um, that unites our curators um, whose diverse research interests um, you know, represent our scientific excellence. Um, there are not any among them uh, with an explicit focus on health and disease except the, the woman in the corner. Um, and as a biological anthropologist and a curator of human remains, um, I've actually spent my time and my skills trying to figure out what's already happened, um, what happened in the past. I'm certainly not thinking about or not in a place to understand um, maybe what's new or what's next. Okay, it's not something I do. And so curating an exhibit on emerging infectious diseases is not something I could have done alone. And I didn't have to do it alone, uh, thankfully. Uh, the exhibit um, was proposed as an idea uh, to our museum in 2014 by Dr. Dan Lucy, who's sitting right over there, um, an infectious disease physician who at that time was treating Ebola patients in West Africa. Uh, Dr. John Epstein, who's sitting right there and who we heard from this morning, um, he came on board from the beginning um, as a member of our external advisory team, uh, which included Dennis Carroll, who's sitting over there, and Larry Madoff, who might be somewhere in the room. There you are. Um, and others. Uh, and then John um, increased his involvement as our uh, chief uh, science advisor um, on the core team in 2017. And so I worked very closely uh, with both of these guys and many others um, to make sure that you know, the stories we were telling, the information we were presenting, that it was all right, um, that nothing got missed, um, and that all is as it should be or the best it could be. Um, in addition, we had a lot of other expertise um, and generous financial support um, on the project as shown here um, among these individuals and groups. And it is with that support and with that expertise and with years of work that we were able to go from this to this. <laughs> so um, as you can see, or I hope you can, can we lower the lights in here at all? Possibly. Can you guys see the, the slides all right? I don't, yes, okay. Um, this is not for cinematic effect. This is just because I don't think you can uh, illustrate communication um, with uh, slides that no one can see. So, okay, um, I hope that you can see here that the main message of the exhibit is One Health. Okay, and so we reinforce that throughout the gallery, um, showing the human, animal, and environmental factors um, that are involved in different outbreaks of zoonotic viruses around the world. Uh, we emphasize the international and interdisciplinary coordination and collaboration uh, that's required to respond to and prevent disease outbreaks. Uh, we also um, you know, maintain a motif of positivity uh, throughout the, the hall um, with uh, bright colors and fun interactives and information on the upside. And as we do with all of our exhibits in our museum, we tell stories. We tell stories about NEPA, about SARS, about HIV, about Ebola. Um, we create experiences um, of working together and searching for solutions and surviving. Um, we have a lot of uh, multimedia in the, in the exhibit that people like to uh, interact with. Um, it creates a very social, engaging uh, learning experience for a lot of people, and that's our project manager, Meg Rivers, who's usually spending a lot of her time making sure none of this stuff breaks. We are fortunate to have an exhibit core, um, a group of 60 volunteers um, trained by Ashley Peary, um, who are in the hall during all public hours in order to have conversations and answer questions um, and um, catalyze you know, um, uh, you know, uh, conversations with the general public. 
And we are very fortunate with the support of the Public Health Foundation and CDC and USAID and many others to be able to train these volunteers um, so that they can deliver the best information um, to the public with whom they are interacting directly um, and representing um, so much of that information and work as others can't. Um, we were able to actually, I think, even better prepare our volunteers to have those conversations by doing a quick survey, um, sort of a, a small assessment of what our visitors knew about infectious diseases before the show opened. Um, and we did find, which is, I guess, consistent with what I've heard, um, we understand the, the general public um, feels or how they perceive different sources of knowledge about, about this kind of content, that um, people did find the majority of their information about infectious diseases from social media, for example, um, or more so than other sources, yet they don't trust it. Um, the sources that they identify as being trustworthy for that information are doctors and scientists and government agencies, yet they do not get their information there um, because I think they simply don't have access um, on the same level. And so that seemed to be a place where we could actually um, maybe uh, do some good with a lot of the programs um, and uh, free events that we offer in, in relation to the exhibit in the, in the museum after hours or even um, during hours um, that allow the public to have those conversations with doctors and <laughs> scientists and public health officials, um, see films, play games, and uh, do things um, that they can both enjoy but also find very informative. Since we opened uh, the exhibit in May of this year, so four months ago, um, as of this week, we've had about 670,000 people uh, see it. Those are the number of people who have come through that hall, not through our museum. So that's a pretty accurate number of just the number of bodies um, in that space in that time. In addition, uh, we estimate that we are maybe getting about 1,000 people coming to our programs a year. We're doing five of them um, about um, in a year. We're open for three years. So at the end of our run, um, you know, we can, I think, safely estimate that at least 6 million people um, will have uh, been reached. Um, by this project in our museum. And I think that that's a bit low because we're going through a lot of renovation right now and next year is gonna be, I think, a very busy, busy time for us. Um, and that's great, you know? I mean, that's a lot of people. That's a big number. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, one of the, the, the big challenges we recognize in doing an exhibit about global health um, and, you know, with presenting the message that, you know, this is, this is information that matters to everyone everywhere, um, is that, you know, we weren't taking the exhibit everywhere, right? It stays in Washington for those three years. Um, and what we do know about our visitors is that most of them are US-based, right? I mean, I think we only get about 20% international visitors in our museum, roughly. Uh, so, you know, the question of how to, to take it global, I mean, as, as Tony Fauci said this morning, I mean, there's nothing more global than infectious disease. Um, you know, that, that was something that we really had to think about. Um, a traveling exhibit is common for a museum, like the kind of exhibit that gets licensed or loaned to maybe like another museum for money. That happens all the time. Um, but that couldn't ensure or in any way suggest that we would actually reach or communicate effectively with people in places wherever this went, right? I mean, the one thing we do know is that when it comes to communication and, you know, messaging um, and engagement on these issues with communities elsewhere, it shouldn't be us, right? We don't know how they learn. We don't speak the language. Um, we just don't have that cultural understanding um, and really that position. Um, that would be most appropriate to um, effectively um, and accurately um, address whatever their needs are. And so what we came up with and what you all have been seeing this week um, surrounding us at these exhibits, or at these talks, has been this do-it-yourself exhibit. Um, the DIY, outbreak DIY, that's what we came up with. And this is another new thing for our museum and actually for the Smithsonian. And it's just new in so many ways. Um, it is a customizable, uh, translatable, uh, mobile, free version of our exhibit. 
um, that we are making available as widely as we can. Um, that's Carrie Dean up there. Uh, she's the manager of those assets, and she's the person that you contact um, if you want to find out more about accessing the material. Uh, so let me tell you what Outbreak DIY involves, because uh, there's a lot more than you may realize based on what you've seen here. Um, we created a resource guide, for example, um, to give communities information about what the project is, what Outbreak is, um, tying it back to our show, but also um, explaining what the thinking was behind it. Uh, we explain, you know, we identify what the different panels are. We created 16, we designed them um, in English, um, capturing basic concepts and messages, um, as well as two templates um, to be customized, um, you know, with, with additional content that we would have no involvement in or say over um, uh, how it's used. We create a style guide to, create people, uh, to help people do that, including um, and especially for um, different translations. We provide promotional materials um, if people want to promote their shows, um, as well as ideas for printing and what their costs might be in uh, doing whatever displays they choose. We also provide ideas and tools to do um, activities, programs like those we do in our museum, um, as well as access to the training materials that we provide for our own volunteers if people want to train theirs. Uh, we've done five translations um, of Outbreak DIY to start that we can offer, um, and that includes the multimedia that I was talking about earlier. We include six pieces um, of uh, videos, interactive games, um, and maps that capture different concepts and provide the same experiences that people would have um, in our museum. And so when we opened the show in May, um, on May 18th, that's our reception, we also had the DIY ready to go. And so I would say it was a global opening um, and we just had to wait to see what would happen. <laughs> so what has happened? I will just highlight a few of the shows that I know about that um, have uh, gone up in these past four months to give you an idea of how far this project has spread. So we previewed the DIY at the PMAC conference in Bangkok back in uh, January, February of this year. And so this is how they did it. They had it fully on display, but they had translated, they did bilingual presentations of all the panels, um, English and Thai. And so the uh, PDMAC Secretariat did that um, in collaboration with the National Science Museum in Thailand, who then took the show and they uh, reopened it a few months later and said so this is in their own gallery where they have actually uh, remounted those panels. And the first one you can see there um, about MERS in Thailand 2015, that is one that they created themselves um, that I saw for the first time uh, when I went to PMAC. And they've created this uh, wonderful um, surrounding for activities, as well as other content that's entirely their own, that has a focus on mosquitoes um, and you know, other issues that are particular relevance and importance for their community. In Finland, um, uh, I think uh, we see a, a show at uh, the Hirika. Finnish uh, Science Center that wins the prize for translation. They actually did two of them. They took our panels and they translated them into Swedish and Finnish. Um, and they created three additional panels um, in order to highlight the role of Finland in global health security, as well as uh, to focus on 1918 pandemic flu, as well as to um, explain the economic impacts of pandemics. Down in El Salvador, um, the Spanish-English bilingual presentation is on display right now in the capital city at the National Museum. Um, and I'm going to be going down there actually next weekend to speak to a, um, a number of health, uh, public health communicators um, about ways that they might want to customize this show um, and use it um, uh, more effectively as well as um, take it to other places. 
Uh, we've seen it used um, you know, in a workshop um, at a hospital in Yemen, where I believe the focus of, uh, of the event was, um, I think, specimen sampling as well as the uh, current cholera outbreak. And you can see that they were using uh, the Arabic um, English uh, translation of the panels. Um, I don't know if they've customized anything, but certainly that is their choice. And then in Washington, D.C., um, that's Robert Costello, by the way. Um, he's our educator on Outbreak. Uh, Robert is working on hiring a community coordinator for the DIY to be based in D.C. Um, and to hopefully facilitate more shows and engagement with communities in our area um, to have it used um, uh, by, by young people um, and in places um, where we may not otherwise be reaching them. That's also Tony Fauci. I don't know if Tony's still here, but um, he's been a tremendous supporter of the project from the beginning and came to speak with us numerous times while we were developing the content in order to make sure that the HIV stories in particular were exactly right. Uh, we've seen it down in Georgia, uh, where the CDC actually customized the panel to highlight their work. Uh, there's a show right now in Baltimore at a biological sciences library health library, uh, where they have incorporated content about 1918 flu. They're showing PPE, and they've got this very cool display um, actually hanging their panels from the ceiling. Here we're seeing it in West Virginia. Um, it's in a student uh, rest area that gets a lot of traffic um, and provides some more information for people who are just spending their time uh, in this lounge. And then, of course, here at Harvard, right? I mean, I think the most amazing thing, um, you know, about this is, is the surprise that I get to uh, see what people have done with what we created. And so to be here, to arrive here this week and to see for the first time eight panels um, that are beautiful, you know, and that reflect everything going on here and enhance the show in so many ways and are so specific to this setting um, and build on what we created. Um, that's so exciting. And so I don't know if you realize, I mean, the ones in the back, right, um, and out front, those are the ones that John and I created um, with uh, our writer and graphic designer back in the museum. That's the set that anyone can get. But the ones downstairs are the ones that were created by all the folks here at Harvard. Um, and I recommend that you check them out and see how you can really visually integrate uh, this new content so that it doesn't look you know, inconsistent. We were very attentive to concerns about you know, how we could really um, help people put together something that you know, looked good and actually um, integrated this content in a way where it wasn't obvious um, or it didn't look like it was DIY. You know, that it, it would look nice and people would want to read it. So, yeah, those are just a few of the shows that I have time to tell you about right now. Um, but to my knowledge, this is where we will see um, all the DIY exhibits happening at least through the fall and I think into the next year. So um, we are a small shop. We are a you know, a hard working but tiny group of people uh, behind this project. And so I'm just trying to draw attention, uh, raise awareness about the project by posting photos when I get them um, on social media. My museum tries to keep up with me. Um, but anyone who knows about one, sees one, wants to do one, uh, we have a hashtag that we're trying to use, Outbreak DIY. Um, and so please follow it. And then I will just sum up um, by saying that, you know, we are just at the beginning uh, of this project. It's um, a really cool opportunity, I think, to address a lot of the challenges that we've all been talking about and are aware of concerning community engagement um, and public communication about infectious diseases. Uh, we've had over 100 um, venues, individuals reach out to us um, without any sort of you know, obvious, um, sophisticated online presence for this project. It's been mostly word of mouth. Um, over 100 people have reached out to ask for materials. About 50 um, of these folks have gotten everything signed, the MOU, you know, registered with us and gotten access to the Dropbox folder, which has the wonderful things that constitute Outbreak DIY. 
Um, and in addition, uh, we have a number of super spreaders, as I'm calling them, uh, Harvard being one of them. So uh, as Shauna was saying, HGHI, they are going to be facilitating DIY shows in 20 different countries, um, I believe, um, helping with customization and, and translation and whatever else displays. Um, ASM, uh, American Society for Microbiology, who funds Ashley Peary's um, position with us as an educator, actually. They also are funding 25 of their young ambassadors um, to do shows um, yeah, in all around the world. And I think right now they've identified um, venues in at least 14 countries and seven other states. Um, and the, the photos I showed from Yemen, for example, that was an ASM-led uh, project. Also, um, I'll just briefly say that the photos I showed from El Salvador, um, that host, uh, that museum, the, that health communicator, uh, was part of a US um, State Department uh, program called uh, Mission Mosquito, where uh, people from uh, Zika-affected countries um, came to the US, they had some training, they did a workshop, and then our project was offered as one opportunity um, with funding um, to help them communicate their messages back in their home countries. Um, and then finally, um, DAI, um, I just learned, um, as part of the um, preparedness and response project with the USAID, um, they are going to be showing panels, I think, at in 11 different countries um, this coming fall in West Central Africa, West and Central Africa, as well as Southeast Asia. And so, altogether, I mean, that is you know, 50 different countries at least, right? And so. I guess I just want to say that uh, we are going truly global. It's very exciting. I have no idea. I have no idea how to even begin to think about how many more people might um, see, uh, you know, this content, um, you know, become aware of this exhibit or learn from it um, as a result of this. But I know it's quite many more than we would be reaching otherwise. Um, and you know, this project, um, you know, this opportunity. This exhibit, it's, uh, it's fast, okay? It's um, mutating, um, and it's highly transmittable. Um, and I think in that way, it's everything that it should be. And um, I will just end by thanking my team back at the museum. I mean, this is a lot of what I was doing for the past three years, um, sitting at tables like that one, um, and having conversations like the one that's been frozen in that moment. And I will say as a scientist, um, to do that with a bunch of non-scientists and try to come up with a way to communicate what you want visually um, and through words and to hear why that's not gonna work, why that's boring, what they don't get about it um, is so informative and has really been rewarding and special. And I think that um, anyone given the opportunity to do that um, would certainly learn a lot from it. So thank you.